things to say at the end of the, at the end of the presentation about the new feature, the generative AI in Photoshop mm -hmm. and AI in general, and what's happening in the world of artistic images. Uh, and it's very confusing in relation to photography, but I'll make some comments at the end. First, let me start with the aspect of what makes a photograph something that comes to mind or has what I say, an image impact the first time it hits the screen or the first time somebody sees it. So impact is very important. And I'll talk about that. And then adding to that is tell a story a little bit in the image. And that really brings the person's attention to it. So you don't take pictures, you make them. Stop taking pictures and make them. You think ahead of time of what you're shooting. So think about these, and I pulled these off the web. Instant impact. There's no doubt you, can, you, you can't stop looking at that and think, oh, hey, wait a minute, in, in a bulb. Oh, yes. And tell a story. How clever is that for telling a story? But here's what I mean by this. Instant impact. The mother and the baby. And it tells a story. It elicits emotion. The more that you can have an image that elicits the emotion, especially in your competitions, the judges will rate it well. And that's what gets you an award. Instant impact and eliciting emotion. I shot this in Northern Italy. And I visualized the image when I was in the field. One of the things so often somebody thinks, oh, well, you were lucky to be there and you, and you got it. No. I was driving through that area because it was it's so scenic and I could see the clouds forming and the light. And so I stopped the car, went off to the side of the road and started to think of composition. And we'll talk more about dark on the foreground and things like that in a minute. How do you present an image? But I'm standing there and really looking at the image and the composition that I want before I start shooting. I think how I can present it in a new way. What tools can I use to highlight? And you see the carriage down here? Well, actually that's a composite. I shot the carriage a little later in the day. And so I put it in there to tell a story coming down the road, the carriage coming into the little area. So tell the story, not just show the scenes beauty. In this example, this was shot in Italy, and the special light makes the scene so interesting. Boy, it lights up in the darker area on the right-hand side, so your eye will always go to an image to the lightest area. That means the darker areas push the viewer's eye into the lighter areas. And the sunrises and sunsets are special times. And I remember the first time somebody said, oh, your best shots are going to be in the morning. Well, I don't like getting up that early in the morning, but it's certainly the best light or late day is the best light where you can really get the kinds of things you want. And again, we react to them emotionally. Now, this again is a composite. The lady with the sheep, I put them in there to so the, the scene is a panorama in Italy, but I wanted something more than just looking at the scene. So to tell a story. This is out in Berry College. <clears throat> uh, Greenbrier School is out in Berry College. And so when the viewer sees this image of mine, and I purposely was playing around for Halloween, uh, it didn't need explanation. Here it is. The, the ghost, the witches brewing, the dogs coming out from behind the tree. So I was putting together really just a story. But the shot, the original shot, is of a, a schoolhouse and a church in Berry College. Now I'll show more about this image later, but I, I bring more impact in my images by building what I call an art piece. And as at the end, and I talk about AI a little bit, this whole world of artificial intelligence is changing things related to photography, especially, but what we call images or photographic images, especially, and 
art pieces. I shot this in the zoo. So remember, tell a story? Well, watch. Standing there watching this orangutan, and a zoo guard came up and he said, let me tell you about that little baby. Its parents died, and the female orangutan adopted the baby, and the baby will stay with that parent until it's 14 years old. That's how loving the, these uh, orangutans are. But while I'm standing there and looking at the composition, I'm thinking already, I'll, I'll blur the background, I'll darken those bright green leaves in the background or grasses, so that, and I'll, bright, I'll lighten the eyes and the face. At least I'll do that. But then while I'm standing there and I'm taking some shots, this happens. Mama turns and looks right at the baby and the baby is looking back and you see a darkened the background, highlighted the faces, and now it tells a story even more with that mother looking at the baby that way. Instant impact right there on those two faces. So here are the techniques that I use. One is, I think simple backgrounds, example on the right here, this image, which I shot in Costa Rica. But the background is very simple. You don't want the viewer looking into the background to find something interesting. The interesting part is right there in the first front part of the image. So simple backgrounds. I'll talk more about this. Selections and creative filters. Show you what I do with some of those. Multiple image layering. And this is, I, you talked earlier about AI and what are your, club rules related to images being submitted for competition, it gets very, very tricky and messy nowadays with what can be done in Photoshop and in Lightroom and so on related to multi-image layering. And did you as the photographer shoot each of the layers? Panoramas are very effective, show you those. And what I call artistic reality, it is the scene, but I've done some things related to adding some other images to it, as I showed you just some of those images in the first part of the presentation, and I make the composites, but I'm creating art. I'm not trying to show documentary, I'm creating art. So instant impact, tell a story. No doubt about the story here. These two were shot in Costa Rica and the simple background, but I also did the white vignette because now, although your eye goes normally and naturally to the white areas, the white vignette brings out more, allows your eye to see more of the color and the two frogs. And these little frogs are only uh, an inch to two inches big. And they were just sitting next to each other. And I thought, wow, yeah, that's a nice composition. So simple backgrounds. Shot this at a rodeo and the background, so it was later in the day. And as the rider was coming through, I could have just the simple sky, no clouds, because the clouds would draw your eye into the image more. But you also see that I have detail in the flowers and the grass down in the bottom portion. A lot of my studying and reading of Ansel Adams books is he is very sensitive to detail in the shadow areas and texture in the highlights where the mind expects to see detail, texture. So no blown out highlights and in the darker areas have detail. Now, even in this case, it's a rather simple background and the light is so wonderful on the bird and the branch coming up from the left we read in our culture left to right. So your eye really enters an image from the left and comes across. So many times I've seen someone with, a, say, an image like this, and it's flipped horizontally. And so the bird is on the other side. But what happens is the eye comes in from the left and then moves off the right-hand side. So this way, this stalk, flower, pushes your eye back to the bird. So your eye comes in from the left. It's the brightest area and it's light against dark. Light against dark is something Ansel 
did all the time in his black and white. And that creates three dimensionality. When something is bright against dark or light against dark, I mean, uh, dark against light, it creates three dimensions. Got this in Costa Rica also. And it was just perfect for them to be cozy up to each other. Well, the background was rather detailed. So I could do a selection of the two birds and the branch, do an inverse of that, and then just darken and blur the background. So it's very easy to do. And that brings out the more three-dimensionality. And so when that hits the screen, instant impact. Tells the story right away. Also in Costa Rica, and in the same area where I shot those two birds, and you can see that's the cage that was in the background. But the toucan is so beautiful, so I'm thinking, okay, I know I need to do something with the background. I won't only blur it or darken it, I'll change it entirely with some simple techniques within Photoshop so that I can bring your eye right into the bird. So that's what I did. I took a color from the beak for the reds area, the red areas. I took a little bit of the green from the bill and allowed a light area in the background. And in Photoshop, it's very easy to do that. You make a selection of the bird and the branch, and then you create a, a new blank layer and <clears throat> do an inverse so that you have just the background. And then you can just use some of the tools and create that kind of background. Look at the presentation of that versus that. And very simple to do, but it's artistic. And that's where I'm going. I want things to be artistic. This is Grog Treat Sun Tunnel down in Atlanta. And I'm thinking, how cool is that with the, with the backgrounds and so on? But what if I just zoom my lens while I'm shooting to give it a whole different look. And that's what I did. So I zoomed the lens. Now I have two images, one with the sharpness and one with the zoom. And I put them together and then blocked out the center portion so it could remain sharp and allowed the, the blur to be behind it. See, there's the original. And here is the artistic presentation. Same with this. This is Dragon Con in Atlanta. I really enjoyed Dragon Con. And this fellow was wandering around and I thought, okay, it's, this, is, this is so good. But I need to do something about that white area up in the top, the white part over here in the left. And I want to bring you right in on him. So I think I can do some zooming work, do two layers, and then bring the sharpness out of his face. And so I could do something like that. Now, think about what I said, instant impact, Tell a story. It's right there. You can't stop looking at his eyes. Frog Street Tunnel again. Just doing the zoom and bringing out a whole different artistic aspect and colors. So this is a simple approach to things using backgrounds or motion blur. Present the image with no doubt to the viewer of what you want them to see. So how about selections and the creative filters? Let's talk about some of those. So this is shot up in, uh, I'm trying to think where this is now. Uh, it'll come to me. The engine is just sitting there and I'm photographing it, but I take it into Photoshop and go into filters and get one of the filters and just change it to an artistic presentation. All I did was to use one of the filters in Photoshop, multi-image composite. So I have the original, and then I duplicate the layer, take it into filters, and select one of the, the filters. Shot this at the bike race in Roswell. Now look at all that background stuff, and look at the racers here. So how can I present this in a way that I'm showing you this lead biker. Well, the first thing is I want to isolate him and keep him sharp so that I would blur the others with the zoom blur. That's one of the features of the blur tool, zoom. So I zoomed around him 
which took out all that stuff in the background. And I used a, a mask on the layer so that I could bring back these other bikers, but keep him the major sharp area. So that was just using a mask on the blurred, zoomed second layer of that original image. Same with this one. And I just wanted him to stay sharp and have the others blurred so that shows the action, instant impact, and tells a story. The same with these. And I blurred the other racers so that he would be more outstanding and have them in the background trying to catch up to him. So I'm telling a story in a different way. There's the main sharp area. I shot this up near Cartersville. This is an Osprey, the parent bringing in dinner to the baby. And that's the sky that was there that day. Here comes a real question related to adding clouds. Very easy in Photoshop to put clouds in the sky. And they even bring, give you clouds as part of the filter. But you can put your own clouds, you can add them. And that's what I've done. So the whole image is my shot. So I just put in a whole different sky, lighten the female a little bit more right in this area here. And look how different you feel about mama bringing dinner to the baby. And that darker background makes you see more three-dimensionality of the female osprey. So how about multiple la image layer? Not just one or two layers, but multiple image layer. Shot this in Italy and I thought this was before there was sky replacement automatic in Photoshop. And I had this image, I'm sorry, this is in Scotland. And I wanted to replace that sky. So I had to do a selection of the sky in Photoshop. And then I had clouds that I've, I have a folder with 200 and some clouds in it. When I say a cloudy day with beautiful clouds, I photograph it so that I can have some that I can use. So I added the clouds. Now look at the difference and I saturated the bottom saturated the buildings, because this is flat and plain. But even bringing in the clouds without bringing in some color, saturation doesn't give the same impact that this has. And so I wanted the windmill to be where the dark against the blue area to create more three-dimensionality in that area. And over here on the right-hand side, I wanted the clouds to be where the roof was dark against light, dark against light, create three-dimensionality. And I darkened by burning a little bit of the foreground to push your eye up into the center of the image. Now, all of this is explained in my, one of my books called Fine Art Techniques, Volume 4. You can see them on my website, which is marianaphotography.com. Layers, masks, and selections, and how to do them. In that book, you get you download the sample images that I use in the book and you work on the exercises that I work on in the book step-by-step step using those images. And this is one of them. Chip Rock is very interesting out west. And I do a workshop out there and take people to Ship Rock because I think it's so unique. But I thought, how can I make this a little different? The sky was very nice blue. And you see how darken the upper portion of the sky, bring it down to the lighter area where the ship rock is. But it felt a little, just the feeling of it, even the emotional feel of it feels a little tight left to right. Now I have space on this larger rock formation here, but I thought if I put in moon, create an evening shot and widen the whole scene a little bit, then it looks like this. Look at the presentation of that to that. It tells a story, instant impact, and it has more spatial relationship for you to feel that you can come in to this area. And it's darker in the foreground, lighter in the center, and darker along the top of the image. Brings the eye down in the center of that image. Shading is so very important in addition to sky replacement. 
Now in Photoshop, there is a feature called sky replacement. Edit, get the edit tab, about halfway down it says sky replacement. And you can see this the skies that Photoshop brought to you, but I've added my own skies so that then I can put in a sky and I wanted a sky, one of the ones that had lines, leading lines, pointing down to the main element of the image. And I thought, I do one, I'll do one, same image, but I'll do it as sort of a an evening colorful image. So look at the difference of original to daylight. And then sort of an evening shot. And you see I've darkened this foreground, darkened along the top, and allowed the detail in all the areas here. In fact, now that I see this the screen now, I think I would remove some of the blue, uh, lessen the blue, not remove it, but lessen the, the brilliant blue in there and allow the whole image. Because my eye keeps coming in now from the left, remember from the left, and tends to stay in this area. So I think a little less blue would allow the eye to then roam around the image a little more. So shading and the sky replacement. Got this last year in Santorini, Greece. Uh, I was there because my, I have two sons and my elder son had been divorced for about eight years and was getting married. And he was getting married in Santorini. I'd never been to Greece and always wanted to go. And Santorini is an island. It's about, and one hour flight south of, of Athens down to the island, but it's all part of Greece. And I was standing up on a, an upper area and I included the flowers. Somebody said, oh, you put those flowers in it. No, I did not. While I was standing there, I'm visualizing the image. I'm visualizing how I want to present it. And those flowers were there. I simply needed to put them in the foreground. And this is a panorama. And my mind is already saying that the sky will be replaced. I know that I'll need to do something with that because it's it's bland. And your eye looks all through these white buildings and then up into that empty sky area. So there's nothing there. So I put some clouds in there. And again, I wanted to be sure that I had three dimensionality. So if you look over where that dome is, I have a white cloud. When you add the clouds in Photoshop, you can move them around. So I moved them so that that dome would be dark against light and whatever, so oh, it's a flag sticking up there, it'd be dark against light so that it gives more three-dimensionality. And then I used the burn tool and darkened along the top so that it brings your eye again down into the image. So many times I've seen someone put a sky in and it's bright, too bright in the sense of that's where the viewer's eye goes instantly when the image hits the screen instant impact, but then the eye doesn't go to the main elements of the image. And I needed to worry about, in this case, capturing the detail in all those white buildings because they could have been blown out so easily. But you see, it is a soft light situation during the day, early morning, so that I could get the detail where I wanted it, knowing while I'm standing there visualizing that I'm going to put a sky in there and create more three-dimensionality to it. So a little bit more, say multi-layer, more ancient. Interesting image, but nothing that just jumps out in any way. The sky, that was the sky that was there. And that, let me work on this a little bit. Uh, I like the boat. That's what struck me, the sailboat sitting there and pointing at the, the brown portion over here. So let me work on that a little bit more. So I put in a night sky with the, the clouds and all thing happening up there. And this lighthouse I had photographed up in Maine. So I put it in there and put the light beams in. So I'm creating a story from here. I'm actually creating the story, not just adding a sky and creating the story. And you notice that the ground portion here is more dominant and I stretched it out a little bit, darkened the foreground, 
darken the upper portion of the sky and allow the brightest area to be right here where I want your eye to go. And I, the, the boat is nice, but the lighthouse adds telling a story to the image. That portion. Got this out west, and it was just the interesting structure, and, and it's it's a very old image of mine. And I thought, how how can I do something? I'm talking about how to present something differently. And the sky was just bland. I remember <laughs> thinking of that and what we can do now with Photoshop with replace the sky. How many times I would be somewhere and think, oh, geez, if just we had some clouds, now I don't even think about it. I think about the main elements of the image, and the sky can be put in later in a different, whatever type of sky I want. So I thought, I'll just do something rather simple with this to emphasize that rock structure. So I used just a dark blue sky, but you notice also it has a vignette. There's a vignette around, a darker vignette around the whole image. So look at the how flat that looks now and how much more three-dimensional it looks this way because I've used, uh, taken this into Adobe Camera Raw and use the slider called texture and clarity. And it creates sharpness and texture in the image. Now I took it in after selecting only this bottom portion. And the way I did that was there's an, an, a tab that says edit select sky, select sky. So I did the select sky and then edit inverse. So that gave me everything in the bottom. So I could take the bottom portion in, whoop, bottom portion into Adobe Camera Raw, use the clarity slider and the texture slider and a little bit more saturation, then brought it back into Photoshop and just use the burn tool to darken some of this foreground image, uh, foreground of the image so that your eye is going to the stones sticking out. Now you notice the, that the sky is a little brighter down here, which is a natural feeling. And you have this bright area against the dark area, which creates three-dimensionality. And I thought, let me now play a little bit more with this. So I put in some interesting clouds. And I, as I've looked at it a couple of times recently, I think maybe they are a little bit overbearing as clouds. I put them in and darken the upper portion so that I'm not taken away from the rock structure. And this cloud from the the left, upper left is pointing down to the, the stone structure. More that you have things in the image that lead the viewer to where you want them to go, the better the image. And over here with the rock, the stone, it's dark against light. And even up in this area, it's light against a little darker area of the sky. So three-dimensionality. And on over here at the horizon, it's dark against the lighter area of the sky. And then I was playing more with a different sky and uh, a composite, uh, the animal and the shadow, and uh, I don't like this anymore. But I wanted to show you what, just adding something to tell a story and does it work? Sometimes, sometimes it doesn't. Shot this in, uh, Georgia at the airfield, U.S. Air Force airfield. And as I'm standing there, I'm thinking, of course, the sky needs to be different. And I really would like it to look like it was flying. So I need to remove all. So when I put a sky in, I need to remove all of this stuff at the bottom. And so I took it into Photoshop, put the sky in, and used the mask to mask us. So I created a second layer, put the sky in, masked out all the stuff down there so it feels that it's flying, but it's not flying if the blades aren't turning. So then I used motion blur to turn the blades and create the piece of art. So I spend a lot of time working on the images to show them the way I want. And you're coming in from the left, so you're looking right into the front of the plane. This is shot in Scotland, very unique castle stands out on the water it's the ruins of a castle and this is how I shot it not worrying about the sky thinking okay I can do something with the sky so I put a sky in oh I also thought 
it'd be interesting. How do I tell a story about this? So I had photographed one of the pipers in Scotland, was in one of the main, I think in Edinburgh, I photographed him, separated him from the background. So then I could put the sky in, have the building dark against the light portion of the sky, the leading lines bringing you down into the image to see that castle, put him in there to tell a story, dark in the foreground and dark in the upper portion. So look at the presentation from here down to that presentation of the image. Artistic reality. That's what I thinking of this barn and I thought, ah, it's really a neat structure, but the bright white blown out areas, not a good thing. And it really isn't telling a story in any way. It's just a neat structure. So what can I do? Well, one of the figures, uh, I get in trouble with this a little bit. This is a sculpture up in the Booth Museum. And so I photographed it, did a selection of the figure, I put the figure in the scene, darkened the background a little bit. You took it into Adobe Camera Raw, used the clarity and texture slider. It does some beautiful things. Look at the detail of that. And then put him in front of those windows. Now the dark against light works and he stands out more. And I created the shadow here at the bottom so that you could think that I photographed him as he was walking in with his saddle. Tell a story. This is in uh, San Jose, uh, Taos, New Mexico. This is Taos Pueblo. And I did a panorama of it. And it, because it's just such a neat structure from many, 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 many years ago. And the sky was that. So, okay, I need to do something to have that more three dimensional. So I selected one of my skies, I put that in there. And then, and you notice I have detail in the mountain areas and I kept the detail there and brought some more color into the main structure of the building. It's just a little flat, so a little bit more color and structure and dark in the foreground. But where's the story, John? Uh, well, geez, it's a Taoist playbook. No, it's not a story. So I had this fellow that I had photographed just in the same area and did the selection of him and put him into that, created his shadow. And now he's standing there as one of the inhabitants of the village. And it tells the story. So much different than just shooting the Taoist Pueblo. That's just documentary. Even with the clouds, that's nice, but it's not as interesting as having something that you're creating to tell a story. An old building. This is up in the Smoky Mountains in Cades Cove. I do a workshop there every year in April. And this is one of the locations I take the workshop. And it was just a foggy day and Everybody said, oh, geez, this is not a good time to shoot. Yes, it is. Let's get some good detail. Let's, this is a panorama, by the way, so that we have all the detail in this little other little building over here. But I need somehow to, to tell the story. So I had these two fellow, this fellow and his wife who were walking along the road, just down the road from this area. And I photographed them, but I also asked them if I could, and they said yes. So I took them and added them. So look at the difference of having that and those. You can't stop looking at them versus this. You look at it and say, oh, yeah, it's nice. But now it has. Look at the, the, uh, look at the foreground here, how I've done that a little differently, a little bit more darkening in here and color so that that creates more three-dimensional and a stronger foreground as well as having them walking into the scene. This is in Cataloochee Valley. It was very early morning and we were photographing, there was a group of us, photographing that fog and the, the old structure in the background. And as I was standing there, three horsemen came riding down this road on the left and I photographed them 
and thought, okay, I don't want three horsemen, but I would like to use one of them. So I did a selection of one of the horsemen coming down about where he was when I photographed it. And off to more to the right, really was in the Catalucci Valley in September because that's when the elk rut season is and the males are finding it's their females. And so I had photographed one of the, the uh, male elks and thought I just need to put him in there, especially with his head turning around to look at the rider. So there's tell the story from there to here. Down in Providence Canyon, just south of Atlanta. Now the problem that I have with, with this image, remember I said we read left to right? So your eye comes in and you follow up and you really go off the image is what happens. So I did nothing but flip it horizontally. Now your eye comes in from, oh, and I, I put two characters up on there to tell a story, but now your eye comes in from the bottom and goes up and looks at them, follows up that darker area. And because they're pointing, it points out that way. So as your eye comes in from the left, their motion or their indication brings your eye back to the left and then back up around the image. Again, Providence Canyon. But one of the Indians standing in there to create a story. Now panoramas are very effective and they are so easy to do. Let me show you how. This is Yosemite. This is where I take everyone on, on the workshop. This is one of the areas. It's just, most of the people never get down to this level because it requires a little bit of, of a walk down a path, not even down the, the tough area of, of the terrain, but down the path. And you're standing looking at the Merced River and the reflections in the river. That's the three brothers over on the right. That's El Capitan on the left. And I thought the log in the water brings your eye in, the reflection of the of this area over here on the left creates an interest and pushes you into the image. Now, here's how I created it. Oh, no, this is a different one, sorry. But here, same idea in, in uh, Yosemite. And I, I'm hand-holding. Most cases, you wanna be on your tripod and just overlap each shot by 30% minimum. I'm just hand holding, so I'm guessing how much overlap I need to have the image overlap with the previous shot and then take them into Photoshop and say, do it for me. And it just puts them together automatically for you. It is so easy to do. And look at the impact of that versus any one of the single images below it. This is up in Cades Cove. And this is one of the very well known stopping locations in the Cades Cove area. But most people never do this shot because the road is down, way down in front. I'll explain in a minute more, but let me show you. Here are the images I did by hand holding. Did the one, two, three, four, five, six images, put them together, and here's the final image. And I'm also moving around while I'm up there to be sure that the sun was creating these rays by having it more in among the leaves or behind a branch so that it would create those. Now, the, this barn is back from the main road. The main road is way down here. And that's where 99% of the visitors park, walk up to this main building here, and that's all they do. If you come walking back up past the barn, and up to the top of the hill, you get this scene. And you see, I've used the bushes on the left to be what I call containments. So that your eye, once your eye comes in from the left, it doesn't go back off. And the branches here are not cropped so tightly. So often I see someone cropping the image and they have just a little bit of the branches. No, it's either in or it's out. And in this case, that tree is definitely in. Now, recently, I was looking at it and think, oh, yeah, it tells a story, sort of, but what if I put one of the bears in there, which I photographed down the road uh, in Cage Cove? 
I thought, okay, I'll put him in there and he'll tell a story of sitting there you know, under the tree. This is in Scotland and it's one of my favorite places. I do a workshop there and this is one of the ruins where I take the workshop. <clears throat> and it's a panorama because the sky was working so well and I wanted to give a whole feeling of, of, the, of the scene, not just the castle. And that gives that whole sea feeling of castle and, and the, where the setting of it and the, the lake. And then I darkened the foreground a little bit with the burn tool, keeping detail in the shadow areas and darkened along the top of the clouds. Those clouds were actually there. This is a, an evening shot. <clears throat> darkened over here on the left. And you see the, the way that grass and stuff come down, it's a leading line that leads you right down to the main portion of the image. And these shrubs and trees over here are darker, darkened them so that the only highlights are here related to where I want your eye to go. So I darken the foreground because that pushes your eye more into the center of the image. Darken the upper portion, pushes your eye down, and the main highlight, which is I use the dodge tool on highlights at a very low percent, I think 10 or 11 percent, to <clears throat> bring out the highlights without blowing out any of the highlight area detail. Now, artistic reality is my term. I came up with that term because I kept thinking, how what do we call these kinds of images when we are creating? from multiple images that we, sh we shot, well, I call them artistic reality. And here's the lighthouse in Maine, one presentation and second presentation of it. In the second presentation, I actually put birds up into the sky, put a night sky in, I uh, used the dodge tool to create the light rays coming from, from the lighthouse. Again, back to Berry College. Here is the original shot. And I had photographed uh, the two strange looking characters, uh, one Halloween and also the witches and the, and the dogs and selected them and then put them in. And this is the image I had shown you. These two were standing in that barn in Cage Cove. And I just, they just seemed so interesting to me. So I took a shot thinking, I'll use them somehow. I'm not showing their faces, so that's fine. But they are interesting. So I photographed them, did a selection of just them so that I could use them. And one of the places that I take the workshop is Greenbrier School. And I did a panorama because there's a cemetery across from the main portion. This is actually a schoolhouse. Many, many years old, of course, I think from the 1980s something. And so I put the two together to create the panorama. And I took that husband and wife and put them in the foreground in the cemetery and created a whole different aspect of the greens and the darker areas and the darker foreground. And here's the lightest area in through here. And <clears throat> they are dark against light, creates the three dimensions. So you get a sense of them being mourners. And so that's how I've used them. Okay, I'll go back to this. I shot this out in Abiquiu and New Mexico. I just, such a neat church and with the three crosses. And it, I just, it was just so, so unique. So I thought, okay, I have to do something with this to make it artistic. That's how I shot it. This was the sky I decided to put into it, which I did, and then used the coloring to the rest of the image, but allowed the crosses to be in the white area so that I could have dark against light and they stand out and you can't miss them being there. So now I need to tell a little bit of a story. And also I have detail in all the shadow areas of the sky and in the building and on the rocks and everything and darkened the foreground a little bit. And while I was there in Abiquiu, I also saw this little gal walking along. And so I photographed her thinking, boy, what a great shot. 
So I put her in, created the shadow of her walking in. So now I'm telling a story. So think about this. We went from, from there, to there, to there, to the final image giving a feeling of an evening in the church. And recently I took it into, and I don't like this, but I wanted to show you, Photoshop now has something called neural filters. And one of them, you click on it and it changes your image into a snow scene, just automatically does it. I thought, wow, okay. No, I don't like it in relation to this image, but what a neat feature that you can do to create a whole different look of what you had from an original. And it's just click there and it does it. This is the Taos Pueblo also. <clears throat> As I'm standing there, I wanted to be sure I had detail in the shadows. I'm already thinking about the composition. I know I need to have something that creates more interest and I need, know I need to do something with the sky. So I put a sky in and I brought more saturation into the buildings. See how they are there. Plus in Adobe Camera Raw, the texture and clarity slider. And now I need to have a point of interest to tell the story. So I went back to that little Indian gal and put her in there, walking in. And you notice she is, I placed her so she's dark against the light area of that building, which creates three dimensions, and her shadow in relation to the other shadows. And then I, while I was walking around <coughs> in the Pueblo, I saw these three sitting and working. So I photographed them and then put them into the image to create a whole different look and lightened up the buildings a little bit more because I don't even want this more somber look for them and put them in there to tell the story. Misty Wilderness. I do a Southwest workshop and one of the places I take is Misty Wilderness. Now remember left to right, this doesn't work as well. That's how I shot it. But your eye comes in here, flows down that large rock and off to the right. Now, if I do nothing but flip it around, how much more you notice this structure? And I pulled this off the web. So this is not my shot. And so I used him and put him in just to tell a story. To that. No, that doesn't work so well either. But this area over here, I call containment. So as your eye is coming in from the left, you see the story I'm telling you. You see this structure and it, your eye gets pushed back into the main part of the image. So I took it again, put, this, put the sky, actually the sky is there. I selected it, did more saturation to it and brought out more detail in the shadow areas. And I tried it with one of the dancers that I photographed recently and I thought, no, that doesn't even make sense to be there. So that doesn't work. I took one of the other shots I did from Bisti and darkened the foreground, brought the highlights here and have the color up in the sky. And I added a light ray simply by using the dodge tool that, and put the elk in there to create a story related to the final image. This one is up in Massachusetts and it, has lots of work done on it to make this work. And when I first shot it, I thought, well, wait a minute, the curve of the stone wall brings you right to what I want you to see. But what if I flip it so that it reads better left to right? It actually doesn't read better left to right. This feels empty. This brings you around, doesn't give you the same feeling as this does. And I had first thought about removing, oops, sorry about that, removing this pylon. And when I took it out, it seemed to be just such an empty space. So I keep that in there so that your eye comes around. The pylon actually is a structure that pushes you back in. And I did add the birds up in the sky and I added the sky as a, as a light day e evening scene. Got this in Venice. Truly love Venice, Italy. This is how I shot it. That's 
I did, standing on the Rialto Bridge, looking out over, thinking, yeah, it's a good composition, but it really is not that interesting. So what can I do to make this really an interesting image? So I put in a sky of drama and colored the bottom portion to match the sky. And you see even the reflection in the water. I did a reflection in the water. Now, Photoshop has come out with something called sky replacement, but it doesn't do the reflection in the water if you have water, and it should. I'm sure they'll do something with that at some point. In some of the other software, Topaz, for example, or Luminar, in Luminar, if you put a sky in and there's water, it creates the reflection in the water. So a lot of tools to create artistic images. Look at the difference of from there, just from there to here. Now, what story am I telling? Uh, oh, oh, I'm missing something here. So I had photographed one of the gondoliers off on a different portion of Venice. So I have him in my catalog of things to use. And I put him in to tell the story. He's now growing into the image. Now look at the difference of that empty space down there to having something there that is of interest. Big difference. And if we go back to just the image, to the artistic reality, what I want you to see and feel. I want you to have immediate impact and I want to tell a story. I want to elicit emotion. Shot this at the Great Sand Dunes. Now we'll take this apart so that you can see what goes on with some of this stuff. Uh, I just thought the, the sand dunes were so beautiful. Well, here's the original shot. And I knew that I would crop in at the bottom and color in, increase the color in those areas. But the dark light, dark light is an aspect that I learned from Ansel Adams. If you look at his paint, his paintings, his photographs, he uses the, the alternate dark light, dark light aspects in an image to create three dimensionality. So I was walking down the street of Taos I saw this guy, I thought, oh, very neat. I, I just need to photograph him. I'll use him somewhere. And I, up in New Harley, I photographed the horse. And in Serenby, I, I had photographed some saddles because I thought I'd use these sometime. So I used that saddle, that strap, that horse, the saddle, the strap, and the fellow walking. Put him in there as a silhouette, dark against light, so he's standing out, three-dimensional. Then I put the horse in there. Now I need to make him a silhouette and put the reins from the horse's head to the walker. So that's the final image. I'll give you an example of some multi-image composites. Photograph that little lady up in in Chicago, and this structure is made up of multiple portions of each image, and I put clouds in the doorway, and same with the structure over here. And I had a model at one point, and I put wings on the model and put her in there, I call it Two Worlds. So a good friend of mine, Darcy Ellaby Pino, does some cre very creative stuff. These are all done by her and multiple layers in the image. This is her daughter. And the only thing that is of the original image is the daughter's arm and the head. Darcy has put her dress on it, put the background stuff in there, put the bird in there, created the highlights, the shadows. It's a beautiful piece of art. She did this one of her daughter. In fact, here's the original shot up in Old Car City. She worked on the background a little bit. She created a foreground of waves and things. And separate, these are all separate layers in Photoshop. Some things on the forehead. Oh, and that's, that is the final image. So one other is this one, which I think is very creative. 
And here's the background. Here's what she did to put some piece into it. She layered it with some musical notes. She created the color and the range and some additional fish. There's another one of her daughter. So we talk about creative aspects and so much today is being talked about with artificial intelligence. And you can go into mid journey and say, I want a picture of a beautiful gal with a seashell on her head, some trees in the background, and it will create the image. It has nothing that you, no images of yours, but these are all created by Darcy with multiple layers of her daughter. So these are her images, every portion, different layer. One other person that I think is extremely good at creating artistic art is Dominic Chapineau. Every part of this image is a separate layer and a separate photograph that she took and put together. Look at this. Every one of these ladies she had photographed at an outing and everyone in the background, she had photographed the engine at a different place. She created this image from multiple images that she has. This one also, tremendous art, beautiful. I had worked with uh, uh, Kelly R and I actually managed to have her work exhibited at the Booth Museum. She lives in Michigan and these are artistic pieces of her daughter and her creativity. And Kelly Dobson is going to be one of the Booth Photography Guild speakers, uh, I think in July, July or August. And here are some of her work, multiple images creating, very interesting. <laughs> How about this, the three bears. Just beautiful work. Now this is also a member of the Booth Art Guild and Cheryl Paris does so many things. If you look on Facebook, you'll see multiple images of her every day. She creates these separately from multiple, multiple, multiple images that she has. This beautiful artistic work. Now the question really comes up before I go here. The question really comes up is what about this new AI, mid-journey AI? It is not photography. It doesn't even have you enter any images. You can enter some small, small things. That will change. I'm sure that will change. They will have you enter some of your images, and then you put in a text of what you want to see, and it creates a whole new piece of art. And also, I've read recently that they may actually create videos at some point going forward. I was up in, when I talk about these other images like this, I was up at the National Convention in Nashville, National Photographers of America, because somebody said, oh, the, the professional photographers don't do those kinds of things. Yes, they do. This was one of the winning prints at, at the convention. Look at this one. How many pieces of other images were put into this final print to make this? Bench, person standing in there, the person on the phone, the dog over here on the left, the window, the door, multiple, multiple images to create that final piece of art through photography, not artificial intelligence, but it's changing. It's going to be a really tricky thing. And what I'm hearing is the term artistic image or those kinds of artificial intelligence. My term, of artistic reality is photographs presented artistically. I do one-on-one -on -one tu tutoring on Zoom. Your initial half hour with me would be free. And then if you like what we do, I charge $50 an hour. I have multiple books. You can see them on my website, Understanding Layers, Masks and Selections. And you work through the exercises with me. I have one on fine art techniques where you talk about 
easy stripper and camera roll techniques and things like that. And I have one on Yosemite and all the best places to go in Yosemite at the time of day that you need to be there. So you don't take pictures, you make them. Fine art photography, that's my email address. If you want to send anything to me, it's jmarianaphotography at gmail.com. And my website is marianaphotography.com. So I'd be pleased to take questions if you have anything. Don, that was all, fantastic. Left you all dumbfounded. <laughs> That's amazing. It takes a, an artistic eye for sure. Well, the, as we were talking, as you were talking about your members, and the same with the Booth Photography Guild, 45% of our members of the Booth Photography Guild are beginning level photographers. And so I don't expect them, nor do we expect them to just create these kinds of images, but without showing them what can be done, they can't learn. How do, how do we get them to see what can be done? And uh, in the Booth Museum of the members we have, only 10 to 15% are really experienced Photoshop users. The rest, beginning level, 45%, and then the others are sort of in between beginning to learn how to do things. And again, thank you for allowing me to present tonight. I really am, am pleased to there's be here. A, there's a question on the um, chat down here that says, how to measure the scale so it doesn't look weird. Ah, good point. Uh, what you need to do is to, when you create an image, let it sit for a couple of days because you get, as you're working on it, you get so intense on how it all should fit together and, and how it feels and so on. Often I go back to an image three or four days or maybe a week later and I end up changing things because I'm seeing it differently and I'm seeing it for the first time of just looking at the image, not all the pieces that I put into it. So do that and you'll see a big difference in your image. Just as a quick guess, what would you say is your average number of hours or days that you spend on one image? <laughs> well, I'm gonna answer it two ways. One is because I am so good at Photoshop now, on any one image, I spend probably an hour. Prior to that, when I was just learning some things, I would be spending four or five hours on a single image and then on multiple days, another three or four hours to get it where I wanted it to be. And a lot of it was in relation to doing competitions. I do competitions. We don't have competitions at the booth, <clears throat> but I have been members of clubs. And so as a member of a club, I wanna win. And so I look at the image and then I let it sit for a while and then come back to it. But again, related to what this whole presentation was tonight, instant impact. How does it look when it first hits the screen? Maybe some members don't know what happens when judges are judging a competition. They'll go running through all the images that were submitted very quickly is usually the way it's done. And so what images tend to hit the screen as they're doing that and it stands out and sticks in their mind so that when they come back through to select, say for the exhibit they, or for the awards that night, there's going to be first, second, third, fourth, and four honorable mentions. So that's only eight images. So they're starting to already think, okay, what eight, what eight, what eight. So as the images are going by and they're looking at them, it has to be boom, hits the screen. Wow, yes. And tell a story has even more impact. And that's how you get awards for competitions. Well, John, thank you. Anybody else got any questions? Well, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Oh, thank you, John. Appreciate you coming in. Yes, sir. Yeah, John, thank uh, th thanks a lot. It's always good to hear your story. And I remember watching you about two or three years ago. And I remember how the eye travels left to right and put your anchor on the right side of it. So, oh, good. Uh, so sometimes I, this stuff sticks, believe it or yeah. not. I wonder how many of your members are thinking, oh, I never thought about that. I'll tell you, even today, I go through uh, 
Facebook and I look at a, at a number of images and I see some really good bird images and owls and things and they're all pointing left <laughs> I'm, I'm pointing right and i think just flip it I, i'm so tem tempted to send an email to the prayer or to a, a text <laughs> a, a message to say flip your image and take a look at it see how it reads differently big difference so your members who are listening tonight do it with one of your images and see the difference all right i'll thank well, you john well thank you yeah thanks john Take care. Uh, for the folks on the call, if you have any uh, thoughts on on use of AI in competitions, uh, please please send uh, myself or more importantly, Laura, uh, just a quick note, just let her know how you feel about it. Uh, this will take longer than a couple of days to resolve, but uh, I, I think we'll come out with a good thing at the end. All right, that that's the extent of our thing. Uh, next next month we've got uh, Mr. Bruce Byers, who seems to be, from what I gather on his website and all that, he's an avid travel photo photographer. He's actually gone and embedded himself on some of these uh, missions. In the in the areas, so he should be real good. His uh, let's see, the title is travel and some of the problems with lighting that you'll have when you're traveling and trying to find the right place to be. So we will. Uh, I guess the board directors gonna hang around a few minutes and thank you for everybody else. Enjoyed it. Title. <laughs>